I realize that the supporters of Faith Goldie are likely to close this video after just the first few seconds. And so it is in the first few seconds that I'm rushing to show you this simple map and these few statistics before I get into a more nuanced and balanced discussion of the underlying issues. In the bottom right corner of your screen right now, you see the percentage of Canada's current population comprised of First Nations peoples. Faith Goldie has stated with no irony that she does not want to be a minority in her own country. I know you've said that you don't want to be, you don't wish to be in a, a minority in your own country. I respect that. I don't want to be either. I don't think that's controversial. Faith Goldie is half Greek and half Ukrainian. Canada, in a very real sense, is not her own country and never will be. And in a very real sense, the Cree, the Ojibwe, the Inuit, the Dene, the Mohawk, the native peoples of Canada have indeed become minorities in their own country. In fact, as you can see here, there are more Chinese people in Canada than all indigenous peoples combined. They're outnumbered by the Chinese and they're pretty much neck and neck with East Indians and Ukrainians, below 5%. Faith Goldie is asking the audience to sympathize with her, with her plight as a white woman who is supposedly afraid of becoming an ethnic minority in her own country, when it isn't her country at all. Faith, the question I have to ask you, just now, just in kicking off this video, just in opening up what is indeed a more complex conversation in which I also am critical of the far left, in which I also am critical of both multicultural policy, immigration policy, all the peculiar quiddities of both left and right wing views of these things. But let's open with a very simple and frank admission that if the audience is supposed to sympathize with Faith Goldie, we must, by the same token, demand of her that she takes seriously the position that First Nations are in when they have indeed become a minority in their homeland. I'm a realist. Uh, that, that's all it is. Uh, you look around the wild and you realize everyone's acting like a group. If you're going to act as an individual, you're going to get eaten alive. Right. So we need to have a little bit of collectivism within our politics. I think in-group preference, which is actually psychologically, sociologically natural. Right. You, you see it in birds, you see it in humans, mm -hmm. and um, Europeans have, through the Enlightenment and the cancerous thought that came therein, um, had that bred outside of them, and now they're being preyed on as a collective, but still continue to act as individuals, and it will lead to not only our psychological dem uh, demise, but also, I mean, where is the white supremacy when every single European nation is about to see whites become a, 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 a minority, basically within the next 40 years? And we're already a minority in the major cities. Like, the future is already here yeah, in terms of Vancouver, here. Toronto, Montreal, and all that. Whether or not the use of immigration statistics by the far right and white nationalists is fear-mongering depends entirely on what it is that you're afraid of. These are official Government of Canada projections, but I reiterate, projections. So they are estimates with a range of possible outcomes for the year 2036. The rest of the population in quotation marks, which I have to assume means white people, is between 69% and 64% of the total, whereas so-called visible minorities, 31-36%. to 36%. Now, the pie chart does not add up to the same total, and I did indeed type in all the data myself using the PDF, the government report. I'd assume that's an old-fashioned rounding error, because the numbers were indeed all rounded off. But, um... Whether we're talking about 69%, 71%, or what have you, what you'll look for in vain in this pie chart is a slice for our indigenous peoples. Arab, right. Where, where are the Cree? Where are the Ojibwe? Where are the Mohawk? Where, where are the Dene on this chart? 
And where is the concern for their future in Canada? Now, I'm not one for conspiracy theories, so I have to give the Canadian government the benefit of the doubt here. But it is a peculiar fact that the uh, indigenous peoples of Canada are ethnically cleansed from this report that is indeed dealing with the future of Canada's ethnic diversity. And um, they're addressed instead in a separate report. Now, in that separate report that you can also find as a PDF on the internet, it's projected that they'll be above 5% of the population in uh, 2036. They put the most likely scenario at 5.8%. I wonder, though, if it wasn't a strategic decision to separate the math into those two separate reports so that we wouldn't have the unseemly contrast between the enormous and growing numbers of South Asians in Canada, South Asia being India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, um, and the diminishing role of the minority of Canadians for whom this is their home and native land. Who needs national identity when you have post-national values? Seriously though, think about these post-national values just for a second. If our culture is to celebrate multiculture, then we are in effect saying that our culture is all the cultures and therefore no culture in particular. We are in effect saying that our values are all the values and therefore no values in particular. We are in effect saying that our land is a land for all the people and therefore no people in particular. Some people say that even a broken watch is right twice a day. <laughs> I don't even know. Faith Goldie, Faith Goldie, maybe she's right maybe once a day. I don't know. She can't, she can't possibly be wrong about everything. Um, the questions she's raising about, shall we say, the semiotic significance of multiculturalism. Those are questions of real urgency in the year 2018, and I think they're only going to become more urgent. Why? Not because of the vocal minority of white nationalists, of softcore neo-Nazis, of people promoting the idea of an ethnostate. I think these questions have become more important than ever before because simply neoliberalism is going out of style. Neoliberalism in its early period, more commonly referred to as neoconservatism, a remarkable reinvention of an economic theory from, I don't know, one part of the mainstream political spectrum to the other, from neoconservatism to neoliberalism. Topic for another video. Um, neoliberalism actually presented a wildly new and foreign attitude towards immigration policy. And uh, it boiled down to this. Recipient nations like Canada and England were in a position to profit from the third world by importing skilled labor who would arrive in those countries already educated, i.e. who would arrive in Canada having already gone through medical school in India. They would arrive in Canada as a fully qualified medical doctor, for example, or, for example, a nurse from the Philippines who's already gone through all of her years of schooling and education would arrive in Canada. And I think it has to be said, in the early period, especially in the United Kingdom and Europe, there was also the expectation that many of these people would earn money in England, in Canada, or what have you, and then return to their country of origin. Um, one influential example of this as a legacy of the British Empire was actually England's interaction with Nepal. So large numbers of Nepalese migrants would come to England, earn money, and then return to Nepal in their old age. Nepal is hardly the only example. And when you do the math, this is an almost parasitic economic relationship between the first world and the third world. When you add up all those millions of dollars that go into taxes, it's unbelievable just how much is being spent by the government on you on the years before you enter the workforce and after you leave the workforce. Uh, and then they only get to milk you for tax dollars during those relatively few years where you're a productive tax-paying member of the workforce. Now, especially if you talk about skilled workers, architects, medical doctors, nurses, I may sound like I'm joking here, but no, it might be twenty the first 25 years of your life when you're spending taxpayers' dollars on healthcare, education, etc. And it may be the last 25 or more years of your life. People live for a long time now when you're in the hospital receiving nursing and what have you. And uh, by cutting out those costs, by recruiting uh, labor, immigrant labor, from, well, basically from anywhere outside of your own country, not necessarily the third world, but it often is, countries like Canada and the United Kingdom stood to gain. This was in the government's interest 
short-term and long-term, to have a perpetual influx of skilled labor. Um, first things last, however, the big fundamental shift in um, economics and politics, which was seen throughout the neoliberal world, even in countries like Japan, that actually remained opposed to mass immigration, both they're both opposed to the immigration of, of skilled labor and to uh, cheap, uh, low salaried labor, um, was the idea that it was in the government's interest to undercut the wages of workers at all levels, that it was in the government's interest and society as a whole to discard what had become popularized as the virtuous cycle of Keynesian economics. So stick with me here for one second. This actually does come back to racism, ethnicity, and these more salacious themes that we're discussing in this video. Um, John Maynard Keynes, but not John Maynard Keynes only, uh, propounded and popularized the view that what countries ought to do is to put themselves in a virtuous cycle of ever-increasing productivity, which is, say, people um, accomplishing more with the same number of hours of labor, ever-increasing wages, rewarding them for their productivity, and moving up what's called the value ladder, moving up the ladder from uh, cheap, easily manufactured products to ever more sophisticated and exclusive products. So um, the issue here being, if Japan can't compete with Thailand in providing the cheapest labor, Japan will naturally tend to stop manufacturing cheap, easily manufactured products and will go more and more into specialized high-end goods. And indeed, you see this if you even compare today the economy of Italy to the economy of China. They manufacture purses in China. They also manufacture purses in Italy. They're not the same purses. Italians manage to sell handmade purses for $1,000 or more, and you can get a handmade purse from China, I don't know, 60 bucks. Um, and yet they're both competing on the free market at very different ends of the spectrum and with very, very different wages being paid to the laborers and the factories that manufacture the purses. That's an extraordinary example because it's exactly the same product, but by the same token, you can have a situation where partly because Japan can't compete with lower wages in third world countries, Japan and other high salaried, high tech countries with that have ever more of an incentive to specialize in, say, manufacturing aircraft um, because they maybe increasingly can't compete with manufacturing bicycles. But there was indeed a time when Japan could export bicycles to mainland China, and then that time comes to an end when China is manufacturing more and more of its own bicycles, etc. So this was the fundamental cycle of economics, um, and it led to all kinds of ideas in terms of social planning for conservatives and liberals alike, like the general sense that la labor unions were a good thing. That when people got organized, had a labor union, and demanded higher wages, they were doing something positive for society as a whole. Under neoliberalism, even in Japan, where they refused to admit large numbers of immigrants, governments started to take on the opposite mentality in the period when Margaret Thatcher was in power in England and Ronald Reagan in the United States. Governments started to believe it was in their best interest to not just crack down on labor unions, which again the Japanese did a great deal of, by the way, um, but to actively import laborers at all levels of society, skilled laborers like uh, doctors and uh, architects, um, the workers who you see at Walmart, the workers who you see behind the, the desk at uh, Tim Hortons, people selling coffee, totally unskilled laborers up to the highest skilled laborers. And to do this not despite the fact that it would lower wages for workers born and raised in Canada or born and raised in England, as the case may be, but because of that fact, because they started to see it as in their best interest to drive down the cost of labor because they saw themselves not as being on a virtuous cycle of moving up the ladder of value to manufacturing uh, more and more high-tech, more and more valuable services, devices, etc., or even if it's the same product, like a purse, moving up the ladder of value to make better and better purses, so you're not really directly competing with China to make the cheapest purse, you're making the most desirable designer purse, etc. Instead, the neoliberal view of the economy was precisely to try to drive down the cost of labor to remain competitive with, well, whatever the market will bear, the lowest, cheapest wages you can get. And you see the impacts of this across the United States and Canada. This idea became tremendously powerful, tremendously popular. And it was in many ways the engine behind, um, I don't know, the ideological veneer of multiculturalism. Now, I've said in other videos in the past, and I still mean it today, 
from the perspective of indigenous First Nations people in Canada. Multiculturalism is really a code word for genocide, and it's really somewhat pathetic to see far-right-wing thinkers like Faith Goldie, in as much as they can be called thinkers, trying to co-opt this in the name of hysteria over a quote-unquote white genocide. Um, clearly, this does not threaten the position of the white majority, not even in the government projections I've just shown you for the year 2036. Um, I think what it does threaten, though, is worth discussing here briefly. One, if we were to take um, some of the fear-mongering statistics presented by uh, white nationalists, if we were to look at the possibility that in the future Canada would be 80% non-white, if we were to look at that future, I think it's worth reflecting. Who is it that considers that future desirable? What is it that we're trying to accomplish, whether we're sleepwalking into this change or consciously electing and pursuing it? And it's easier to think this through if you were to look at another culture that you may not be so fond of, that you may not be attached to. I don't know anyone who goes on vacation to Saudi Arabia. I know a lot of people go on vacation to Thailand. And in a simple sense, we all know why that is. Now, let's think through constructively. If we wanted to profoundly and permanently change the culture of Saudi Arabia, if we wanted to make it more moderate, more cosmopolitan, more open and receptive to new ideas. How could we really achieve that nonviolently? One of the easiest, most reliable ways would indeed be through mass immigration and multiculturalism. I think if you can set aside your particular attachment to whatever you imagine as being Canadian culture, you can probably see that, whether it's 80% or 60% or what have you, or, sorry, as according to the Canadian projections, I don't know, more like 40%, if you really do have a significant number of new people coming in from other cultures and other traditions, it's going to challenge and it's going to change the traditional culture of the people in that place. And it's open to discuss whether or not it will change it for the better. I think probably anyone who is watching this video right now, it's very unlikely that a Muslim fundamentalist, Saudi Arabian nationalist is going to watch this video, Almost anyone watching this video would probably be open to the possibility that Saudi Arabia would improve if 20% of their population in the future were new immigrants from Latin America. If 20% were immigrants from Western Europe, maybe they had 20% of immigrants from China, some mix. If they suddenly had a massively cosmopolitan culture of people living in their country and to some extent learning and responding to their customs and to some extent adapting them. If you look at Canadian multiculturalism from that perspective, I think it has to be acknowledged there is some political basis for the white majority of Canadians responding to their own sense of dissatisfaction with their own culture by wanting to take this, I don't know, gradual and nonviolent path towards transforming what Canada is and what Canada is supposed to be. Now, what percentage of people today, or more importantly, in the year 2036, in the near future, really sincerely believe and embrace that? What percentage of people really see multiculturalism as a positive transformation of the country? And from my perspective, it's even more important to ask, how do the Cree and the Ojibwe and the Dene feel about it? Conversely, what percentage of people have completely cynically embraced multiculturalism out of the ill-founded assumption that Canada is somehow so technologically superior that other countries that migrate to this country, sorry, other cultures that migrate to Canada will just somehow be overwhelmed with awe at how great Canada is and will then want to assimilate into it seamlessly. Definitely in both Western Europe and in colonies like Canada and uh, Australia, there was a false assumption that the people arriving on this shore would come from far off and distant lands where their sense of their own cultural identity, the sense of the value of their own language and cultural traditions was so weak that as soon as they arrived in, whether it's Canada, Australia, or England, they would be very eager to assimilate. Now, I find that, you know, a strange self-serving delusion in many ways. Um, I don't think that, for example, by contrast, the government of Egypt imagines that people who are 
migrating to Egypt, which is an interesting factor, are so overwhelmed by the sight of the pyramids that they want to become ardent and passionate Egyptians. And yet here in Canada, we have no pyramids. We have no great accomplishments of that kind. On the contrary, what we have is a sense of aimless collective guilt for the fact that we have a paper-thin layer of European culture laid over what we all know is a shameful history of cultural genocide. We don't have the kind of mesisto culture that they have in Mexico. We don't have a hybrid culture of indigenous people intermarrying with Europeans and to some extent preserving uh, and promulgating elements of their own culture intermixed with European ideas and technology. Um, and we don't have an ancient continuous culture such as, well, okay, credit where it's due, Thailand and Cambodia might have. What is the tradition that we're supposed to be enticing other people to adapt to and embrace? And that, I think, that is the one sense in which this broken wristwatch, in which someone like Faith J. Goldie, she, she at least gets to be right once a day. She's here questioning, what does it mean to be a multicultural country? To open the doors wide and say, this land is your land, to the whole wide world, and to say, this land is not any one culture's land in particular. Well, I'll tell you what it means. It's the end game to cultural genocide. And the genocide, the culture that's being wiped out here, isn't German culture, and it isn't British culture, and it isn't Chinese culture either. Each of those cultures has its own homeland that's doing just fine, preserving its own language, literature, philosophy, and customs. The culture that's being wiped out in the midst of all this, the rise and fall of neoliberal economic ideology, is indeed First Nations indigenous culture. And if any of you watching this video, if you actually subscribe to ethno-nationalism, if you actually believe the words that Faith J. Goldie is preaching, look inside your hearts and ask yourself how you would feel if you were in one of these marginalized cultures that now really is looking forward to the possibility of going extinct in the century ahead. Dun, dun, dun.